one of the things I've started doing in the last few years is moving away from the term breaks during professional learning days and calling it reflection and connection time. And the reason I do that is because I think when we call them breaks, we tend to shorten them. Uh, you know, I have 10, 15 minutes, you're at a conference, uh, you're at an event, and then it's like you get just bombarded with information, then you're on to the next session. And so when I was planning with organizers, I would suggest that they have a 30 minute break. People didn't like that. They were kind of thrown off as too much time. Uh, you know, we're not taking advantage of the day. So what I started doing, people started seeing the value is I'm like, hey, let's do reflection and connection time. And how this idea started was I would actually do a keynote, share some ideas, and then I would have someone come up to, you know, kind of share what were their thoughts? What were some of the ideas that they took away from the keynote? And I'd have them share it. We would then do a video and we post it on Twitter and, and they would share their thoughts in front of, you know, an audience could be up to, you know, thousands of people that they're recording a video with me. And then during that 30 minutes, I tell the group that, hey, I would like you to either by yourself or with a group, make a video and share that learning with other people. Share what you learned and make a video, post on Twitter, here's a hashtag. And one of the things that I said and kind of threw people off and I said, look, if you've never made a video on Twitter and you don't know what you're doing, not my problem, figure it out. And people are like, what? Like, how dare you say that? And the reason I said that is because I wanted people to understand that they didn't need me. They could figure this out on their own. And, you know, how did I figure some of this stuff out? You just press buttons until it works. And so you'd watch some people would actually go off on their own. They just press buttons. Some people would go right to other people and they would actually talk um, and say like, hey, can you show me how to do this? How you can connect? Some people would Google it, do whatever. They would find a way that works for them. And they would see their videos pop up on the hashtag during the break or during the reflection and connection time. And why I wanted to do that is because people will get more inf more out of my keynote if they have time to process, to think about their ideas. They would also get something really valuable out of connecting and, and talking to other people during that reflection and connection time. And if you think about some of the favorite things about conferences, a lot of times if you say, what was the best part of that event? They'll say all oh, the conversation in the hallway, but we don't explicitly make time for that informal learning. And so I wanted to do that. And the reason I bring all this up and I encourage you to do that, you know, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, have people make videos, share what they're learning, connect and learn from other people is as I was talking with Brian Carpenter, he's a distributed leader, learning teacher and just kind of listening to him talk about his journey where uh, him and I met in 2011 he kind of was, you know, already doing some stuff with technology and was doing a lot of consumption, but he has his own podcast now and he's creating. And the reason this podcast was recorded because he actually took my podcast I did with Debbie Tannenbaum and reflected on it through video, tagged me, I saw it, and then I invited him on. And you see the learning continuously grows as we expand, as we, you know, consume information, but then we collaborate and then we create. And the thing is, it's not a linear model. It's a back and forth that goes all across the time. So it was a great conversation. I hope you get something out of it. I hope I really enjoyed talking to Brian. Uh, I've known him for 10 years. This is the longest I've ever talked to him, which is really cool because I didn't realize that until we were in our conversation. So thank you again for listening to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I actually have Brian Carpenter uh, with me on the podcast. And he's from Abbotsford, British Columbia in Canada. And we actually first connected in 2011 at a conference that I was speaking at. And we've stayed connected, uh, you know, over the years. And actually just this past weekend, uh, him and, and is it Tim Cavey? Is it right? Yes. Teachers on Fire? Right. Yes. I, it's like he has a teachers on fire. So I always like, you know, forget his name is I think it's teachers on fire is actually his name, but it's Tim Cavey. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're actually um, walking and talking about a, another podcast uh, that I had done with somebody else. And I loved the opportunity to basically respond basically from one podcast uh, through your own podcast. And I was like, well, let's have Brian on the podcast and like, let's kind of dig into the, to this. And I love kind of, I think that's, that to me is one of the best things about social media is kind of going beyond the 140, you know, the old school Twitter account, the 280 characters 
and actually kind of, you know, working out ideas and, and you were doing a walk and talk. And so I actually asked Brian, uh, on to the podcast. And so Brian, thanks so much for being on here. If you could just kind of introduce yourself, um, to everybody and just let everyone know about how you got to where you're at in education today. All right. Thanks, George. Great to be here. This is like a highlight moment for me to be on your podcast because like I've been following you around in the education on through social media and stuff like that for a long time. And you've had an impact on me and uh, the things that I do just through your book that actually I haven't read the first book. I never read it. I read actually the first page and then was like, whoa, and I just took off from the first page. So I haven't read it. That's all I needed. I've seen you talk a few times, right? Worth the price of the book right there. It is right right there. So, so, um, yeah, no, I I ran into you back in 2011 and uh, started my teaching career back in 2009 at an older age because I had a previous um, life as a research scientist at a pharmaceutical company. So that takes me back into university where I trained to be a chemist. I got my bachelor's of science at the University of Calgary. And then I got my master's of science at the University of Calgary. And I was hoping to work for Nova Gas in Alberta making polyethylene because that's what you do in Alberta, make plastic bags and other things out of, you know, natural gas products. And so that's what I was aiming at. And, uh, I finished, and while actually while I was in my master's, lab you know lab assistants and work in labs and teach students how to do the lab techniques and things for these courses, and I taught second year organic labs with a, a guy named Ian Hunt. He was the professor of the course, and he, we started talking about education back then, about ways of teaching students. And I didn't understand any of the language like that we were talking about. We didn't use that language because we were chemists trying to make a difference in in students' lives. And we figured out how to teach this course, do the lab stuff and all that. So my supervisor at the time, he's like, I want you back at the bench, get your research done and get out of my lab, right? Because I had a master's, a thesis to write and all this stuff. And there was that tension. And then I met my wife and we got married during my master's, which delayed everything, which made my supervisor even more angst because I'm like, well, I'm taking up space in your lab because I'm, you know, getting married and all this stuff. And anyhow, all that to be said, um, I left there and started working at a pharmaceutical company in Langley, a research pharmaceutical company, where I learned a lot of things about tenacity and about drive. And well, I had those things inside, but just it had to actually come out every day. You know, what happens when you get bad results? What do you do about that? How do you figure things out? So that was then, and my company was supportive uh, with Science World that we could volunteer as science and innovators in schools, right? And so we would go to schools and like put on a science show and do like a science show and talk about what's it like to be a real life chemist in our world today, right? And try to inspire kids to become scientists or just at least support the science teachers in that to have a guest in the building. So I learned that, oh, I think this is really cool. Like, being able to go into schools and do this and watching kids eyes light up. And I already, so that would just reinforce that. And then at the end of uh, 19, 19, beginning of 1999, no, 2000, no, 2006, um, our company went through a hostile board takeover because one of our board members got grumpy and asked the shareholders and like, it just turned its oh. thing on its head. And we went from a science company to a we are trying to get sold company and they sold the company out from underneath us we were all you know us scientists were all on the street and uh i changed paths and became a teacher and went to sfu got my pdp done there one year worth and i got hired in the abbotsford school district shortly after i was done that so been in the abbotsford district since 2009 taught in a regular building, like a traditional bricks and mortar high school, taught science, math, you know, at the high school level. And then I shifted from there to work at the Abbotsford Virtual School, which is a distributed learning school. And at the time we were paper-based modules and courses and things like that. And over the past 11 years I've been there, and it actually was only took only like four years, we went to a completely online model using a Moodle platform learning management system and uh, have all of our coursework there. And I am still there. So that's how I got to be where I am now. So it's interesting, as I was listening to you and thinking about, you know, you have this expertise, obviously, in the field of science. 
And yep. then you talked about how you, you saw the kids excitement and it kind of made you more excited about that subject matter. And yep. I was just thinking about my own kids. They get so excited about things that I've now taken for granted and don't, you know, don't really care about like going to the beach is the most miraculous thing ever. And, and a little bit of that. And I just, I, I thought about that, about how a lot of teachers uh, fuel their excitement for their subject area through the eyes of their kids, through that exploration. And it's just kind of made me think about how you just kind of tap into that. And so your role is as a distributed learning teacher uh, and for, you, you know, you do some online, um, some um, face-to-face blended kind of model. Yep. I wanted to ask you this specifically uh, when you're looking at, I, I'm a lot of people make this assumption that when 2020, all the, you know, March, 2020 rolled around schools are moving <laughs> to virtual going to yeah. that spaces. I think a lot of people would just assume for you, it was just business as usual, nothing changed. And, um, I've had some experience with some virtual schools that I would tell you something very different, but how was that experience going, uh, even though you're already kind of, you know, in those spaces, like what, what, how was that? Like, what were the challenges that you faced, or was it just like, we just kept going to doing what we were always doing? All right. So my online part of my teaching didn't change a whole lot. It was affected by COVID because we, Part of the part of the cornerstone of our school is that we need to maintain academic integrity with our online courses, and the way, one way to do that is to have our students actually come in and write exams in our building. Right? I need to look in the whites of your eyes, compare your face to your ID, and go, "This is actually George coming to write his test." Right? right. And then George sits down and writes his test, and like, and when George gets you know thirty percent below what he's getting in his regular part of the course we have to ask some questions and we you know have a hard conversation at that point going what's going on right and so um that part changed in the sense that we couldn't have students into our building for those tests we had to actually go to a video conference model where we would invigilate exams through a web camera and really hope that they weren't smart enough to game the system to uh play some games you know to ev- evade you know, the, us figuring out that they're cheating, right? And so right. that was a big change. Um, there's a lot of grace at the beginning because we're like, well, benefit of the doubt says that we need to trust our students and this next three months, whatever happens pretty much is going to happen. And hopefully that if they're cheating, that they'll eventually get caught, right? You know, because we can game a system all day long and, and get around it, but there's going to be a point in time in your academics that you cannot cheat your way through this, right? You're in a job and your boss goes, I need you to do this because, well, your transcript says you can do this and you can't do it then what what's that what happens right you get fired right you you get laid off because you can't do what you said you're going to do so that was one part that actually did change for our blended learning students that come into our building two days a week for you know adst for um like digital literacy and digital citizenship courses and technology stuff we actually had to go to you know, Google Meet class, like we were already in Google Classroom, but turn on the video camera and actually do work through the video camera on a weekly basis. How'd that go? Didn't go very well for my grade 10s. Like they pretty much all went carpenter's class. I'm going to like kind of check out here. I had like right. three students out of 20 that showed up, right? Because I'm like, well, it's office hours. I'll see you guys on Tuesday in my office hours. And I didn't make it a, a, an expectation. I said, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You got other things to do. And well, it didn't work out nicely for them. So, well, I mean, it worked out really nice because at the end of the day, they had to get the grade they had on their last report card, which was pretty fantastic. Right. And then, you know, five months later, they get the same grade because, well, that's the last reported grade, right? So. Yeah, it, well, and it, it's interesting because um, I I would like to, I would like to say like hey a lot of people assume that if you're like in a virtual space uh, and COVID hit that you just continue as is and I would also admit I was one of those people and the reason I bring this up is because I was actually asked and it seems like ten years ago now uh, in February 2020 to do a virtual yeah. keynote. Uh, for a group at the end of March, 2020, not, there was no COVID stuff, nothing like this. And I was like, do I really want to do virtual? Like, do I really want to do a virtual keynote? Like, it's <laughs> my least favorite thing ever. And then I was like, yeah, fine, I'll do it. Right. And, and it was just interesting because 
I I actually quite enjoy it now. I I love it. And I think, you know, uh, now I'm about to travel, be in person. And I think I'll take that any day, obviously. But then this virtual, 100% virtual uh, group then reached out to me when COVID happened and said, hey, we have to uh, postpone the event because COVID. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You are a virtual school. Like, why... What, this is this is literally this is your time to shine like this would be the, the best <laughs> for you. and and so then uh then we postponed it. i'm like okay whatever like i'm you know being understanding and then we postponed it and then as when i did that day what i started to understand was um yeah they were a virtual school but all of a sudden um one of those teachers in that school has uh there there are three four kids who attend attend a traditional brick and mortar school Uh, Now, all of a sudden, they're home, right? Or you have a family where one of the kids goes to the virtual school, they go to that program. And then uh, all of a sudden, they have like one or two laptops uh, as a family. And then basically, they now have all the kids home, and they're like trying to get on these devices back and forth. Right. And then you have another family where one of the caregivers loses their job. And now um, that's an added stress. So it was not just, I think that's the misconception is that it was just easy. And you know, those people are fine is that you have to think of all the dynamics with all the other things that were happening uh, during that space. And so uh, that's why I wanted to ask that question, because I think it is really important to acknowledge that, you know, no matter the space you're in, there is all these complications, because we, you know, the people we serve are people, they have, you know, complicated lives, they have different situations. And uh, yeah, teachers were just incredible, no matter the, the space to kind of help that. Um, when we first met, we first talked in, uh, first connected in 2011, I did a keynote with my brother and you're already in a distributed learning space. Uh, you're kind of already doing that work. And then we talked about social media. So like, uh, and, and the ability to connect and learn. So yes. like, do you remember some of the takeaways you had from that? Because I remember like kind of, I even like, even though it was 10 years ago, uh, I remember first, uh, going to that. I'm like, you know, um, this will be just kind of the easiest group ever uh, because they're already doing tons of online stuff. And I remember there was like some pushback to it, right? And I was kind of, I'm like, you're you're literally teaching with technology all day, right? And it was kind of like, uh, again, a learning experience for me, even though right. I was the one delivering information. So like, yep. is there anything that stuck out to you? And I, I was blessed to be with Alec who, you know, kind of mentored me and in, in lots of the stuff that I do today. and. Uh, if I don't mention that, he gets mad at me. So I got to make sure that whether it's true or not, I got to say it. But um, is there something that sticks out from that time with uh, from that from that conference? Because I know you really started kind of jumping in at that time. Um, so that was my actually my first DL conference that I'd been to. And so the whole school, all of us teachers, we went to the conference and we were DL teachers working with packages and working with students at a distance. And that was fine, but it was more the connectedness of educators. That was the new part for myself as I didn't know anything about Twitter and, you know, Google had, you know, earlier with Google, you know, docs and things like that. And I got a Gmail and back in 2007 because, well, this thing might be important someday. Right. And, and it's incredible how important it is. Um, but what stuck out for me at that is is when you were talking about the ability for teachers, for people to reach out to other people mm-hmm. that quick, like through the social media. If I have a question, just being able to ask that question, right? Asking a question in social media without being there for very long or having a presence there doesn't give credibility to that question, right? Like it's about relationship, right? It it is about very much about relationship. And today I can easily ask a question on Twitter that would have 10 years ago been blown by because, you know, well, who's this guy that's asking this silly question, right? Um, But that was one thing that really stuck out to me and you modeled that and I've watched you over the past 10 years continue to model that just in the way you inter- interact with people in social media and primarily it's Twitter, right? During your keynote, I signed up for Twitter right that day, like on my iPhone three, I signed up for a Twitter account in the ballroom and like, I didn't really understand what that 
platform was about for like four or five years until I became a helping teacher and then saw the value of it a whole lot more. And today, Twitter is my jam. Like that's where I spend my time. I have friends that I I've never met face to face um, that I could go to a conference and we could sit down and have coffee because we've taken time to build those relationships. But then when I have a question, I'm like, hey, what's anybody think about this? And I get responses like lickety split, right? And it's about community. And Twitter is, edu Twitter is about community, right? So anybody that's listening going, well, Twitter's all about, you know, politicians and sports stars. It's not. It's, it's a, a lot of things for a lot of different people. And finding your, your PLN, your professional learning network on Twitter is so significant. It's made a big difference for me. So that was the one thing that really stood out from me for me. And how you talked about having that online presence. And I, her name was Fam. She was going to USC, right? You tell that story about that one student that they, she didn't get in. And then yeah, yeah, she yeah. had her she had her website, Be right? Beverly Fam. Yeah. Yeah. Beverly Fam. And how she had her website. And then, you know, UF, USC, she's like, did you see my website? Like, I really want to go. Like, I want to come to your school. And, and they let her in because, well, whoo, she's got this portfolio of stuff, right, that she's been working on, which at that time was super innovative. Um, mm -hmm. But just being present online is really important. So that's one of the that's the biggest takeaway that I got from that. And it's cool because you think about it, like even when you're talking, I'm like, OK, how many times have we actually met in person? It's, it's twice probably. Right. But it's, like, it's, yeah. it's also weird because I couldn't tell if it was twice or 100 times. Because you just right. are like it's like you're so familiar, right? Uh, yeah. The one thing I have, the one thing I have to, when you talked about Gmail, right? Like, I have this whenever, like, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie. When I see someone with a Hotmail account, I'm like, what? <laughs> you still have Hotmail? Like, I know. Right? Like, do you have, do you have like Lincoln Park Lover eighty nine at Hotmail dot com, right? And it, there's actually because <laughs> like you know everyone had like the like Hotmail so early, and I think it's it's part it's not. I, I like I'm not saying if you use Hotmail you don't know anything or you know like that at all. But yeah. I started it so early and nobody had like everyone had the worst, you know, handle before at hotmail.com. And so oh, right. every time I see it, you know, and you, we would even get like applications to our school and some of the email address, I'm like, yeah, I, I wouldn't put that on. You know, like I know you, <laughs> you need to change that right now. now. You gotta, you gotta change this, right? Like, yeah, you get your red pen. You're doing markups on their resume, life. right? Yeah, nkotb for life at seventy two at hotmail dot com is not gonna, uh, right? You know, this is probably gonna get you the job. So I just kind of uh, think of that. And um, I the the one thing is we're kind of bridging into this conversation. I think it is really important to, uh, you know, build those connections, and mm -hmm. that is a really important thing to me. But there's also that time where I, I step away and I do the more personal uh, connection where we have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, you know, I yep. learn a ton from these podcasts. Uh, but there's also the times with technology where I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to just kind of create content. And sometimes I do solo podcasts. Uh, I, I do a ton of writing. And so I think that allows me to contribute more. And I know that you, you and I have talked before the podcast about Chris Nessie. Uh, and him yes. guiding you through this, but you have your own podcast. And uh, for anyone interested in listening, you check out um, the the link down in the the show notes uh, on YouTube or SoundCloud or iTunes wherever you're listening. Um, but like, how has podcasting like grown your, uh, for lack of a better term, grown your intelligence? Because I and maybe it hasn't for me. Podcast or blogging and podcasting, I believe, has made me a lot smarter than what I'd be without it because it forces me to reflect. It forces me to kind of wrestle with ideas in my head where I don't think I was doing that uh, early on in my career. So like, how, how has that helped you grow as a learner? Podcasting is super important to me and not just creating content myself with my podcast called Fresher at Five, but the how I listen to podcasts, when I listen to podcasts, and uh, who I listen to. And I, I just started reading a book actually by Tim Stevenson um, called Beyond the Classroom. And he's a teacher from Walnut Grove just down the road from where I live here in BC. And he was talking in the one chapter I just read about who is your, who are you the influencers that you listen to, right? Who are those, those people that you listen to to gain understanding of content that you need to deliver to your students, right? Not just for delivering content to your students, but growing you as a teacher, right? right. Um, 
so um for me, I listen to podcasts. I listen to a lot of educational technology podcasts because I teach educational technology. I was an educational technology teach helping teacher. And uh, being able to keep current with what's going on with Google and Google Classroom and just all the different tools that we use on a regular basis, being able to keep up with how is Google Meet changing now? Is it comparable to Zoom, right? Like in being able to answer those questions when people talk to me. Um, how do I talk to my students about technology? Where do I get ideas for creative things I can do with Adobe Spark, which is another one of my favorite things, right? And, and how like just being able to listen to ideas so that I can come to school and be relevant. Like I can walk into my class and be relevant. It's about being relevant. It's about self care, about me hearing teachers stories so that I don't feel like I'm alone in this thing, right. Of, of education that you're not by yourself, that other teachers have experienced the same feelings of, well, I have to do this all by myself. If I let anybody know that, then, you know, I look weak and, you know, how did I overcome that and who did I reach out to? And, you know, it's, I have a psychiatrist and it's not a bad thing and it's a thing, right? And that how we need to do. So podcasting helps me connect to this greater world of educators that's beyond my door. And I do it by listening, you know, putting my headphones in my ears and I head out under the street and this is where my Fresh Air at Five podcast comes from. I go for my morning walk at five o'clock AM so that I'm not disturbing my family. I get home before everybody's awake and I walk for an hour and I listen to two, one to two podcasts a day. And that really has built me and my confidence in being able to, you know, know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about educational technology, know what I'm talking about of, you know, students, you need to actually get some sleep. Like Mr. Carpenter is getting more sleep because he is aware of the signs that, you know, hey, if I'm grumpy in 25 minutes, that's because I didn't go to bed last night early enough, right? And how do we take care of ourselves? And there's a whole lot of things that go on with that. And just listening to teacher stories and just influencers that are out there. So that's podcasting is really important. So those of you that are listening to this podcast, Keep listening to what George has to say because George has great things to say. And there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of great things to say. So shout out to George. Push the button, George. Oh, geez. I don't have the button ready. Bruh. So I got that. I got that one <laughs> That's good. So, okay. This, this is one of the things I do during the podcast. So um, t- typically for probably about half the podcast, sometimes, you know, people have books out. And so I'll just name it the title of the book. So people have more exposure to uh, their new release. But most of the times I'm, I think of the title um, during the podcast based on listening to the guests. And so as I'm reading or as I'm listening to you and kind of talking about that, uh, I talked about uh, basically consumption to collaboration to creation. And, yes. and, I, and it's not like a, for me, that would not be a linear line. It's kind of like a back and forth messy all over yep. the place. Because I think that as you're kind of talking, like it's you're taking in information, you're connecting with people, but then you're dispersing ideas and then making those people that connect with you better. Uh, then you're taking in more ideas, you know, even refining your ideas because of some of those conversations. But I think a lot of people, um, and, and this is a thing in education, we spend a lot of time with our kids consuming information. And there's a very big difference between regurgitation and creation. Because I yes. think sometimes like, hey, if I, if I teach this kid something and then they say it back to me, um, you know, and I know they know it, that's not creation, that's parroting, right? And mm-hmm. that, that doesn't necessarily help that kid kind of work through things out. And I, it's not about like ignoring the content because you got to see you're going to get tested on it based on wherever you're at. But it's actually going into a deep understanding where you can actually kind of riff with it. You can, you know, kind of make sense of it, make your own uh, connections to that content. And I just think you're such a, a good model uh, for that. And, and it's been a journey. But one of the things that a lot of people are probably thinking as they're doing this, because they're, you know, a lot of people listen to this, but don't necessarily have their own podcast, uh, don't necessarily uh, blog or things like that. And I, I wouldn't have started blogging unless I started tweeting and, you know, Twitter is known like early. I don't think anyone really refers to it like that anymore. It's a micro blog. Right. <laughs> so I started writing my thoughts out, but I was like, there's not enough room. I got to go to a larger space. Cause I want to kind of dive in deep and, you know, people can take this out of context. You know, I can't like people getting mad. I'm like, well, that's not what I was trying to say, but I, you know, ran out of characters. 
but even as you started your podcast, um, it was not, it was not like, Hey, I'm going to go and record an hour. You, you basically did it in, you, you still do it in like smaller bits. So like for the person that is like, maybe I'm going to start doing this, like kind of what were your steps to have a little bit longer podcast to get kind of doing what you're doing now? Like what, if I was starting off, uh, how would I start? What, what advice would you give to someone, you know, just to kind of take that first step? So I started off with Twitter and it was 140 characters back in the day. And then they stretched it out to 280. Right. I think. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I, I started listening to podcasts and then I'd be like trying to type and then I get the hashtag, you know, at right. G Koros in there. And then I got hashtag, you know, innovators mindset podcast. Like that's long. That takes up that's 50 yeah. characters probably. Right? right. And so you yeah. run out of characters really fast. So I'm like, well, if I can put a picture in there, I can write a whole lot of more words on a picture because right. that doesn't count towards my character count. So I was starting to try to just figure out how to hack Twitter so I could get more information into it. And that's where it started to grow for me. And uh, I listened to Jeff Gargas on Teach Better Talk one day. Him and Ray Hewitt were talking about how he was starting to use his video camera in Twitter to be able to put a video. And I'm like, I can say a whole lot of words in a video. And I learned about that. I learned about what my constraints in Twitter were. And, the, you know, I got two minutes and 20 seconds of a video that I can add. But then I figured out how to string tweets together so that I can put like six minutes and change of video content on a day that's all kind of connected with hashtags. And so the text part of Twitter is is important for being able to connect with people. Like, George, you and I connected this past week because I tagged you in a one of my posts, and it was with Debbie Tannenbaum that you were interviewing, and I listened to that podcast. So then... That allows us to connect, but then I've got my video part that's there that you can listen to that's more characters than what you see on the screen, even in a graphic, right? So I could put a whole bunch of graphics. I could put basically build a PowerPoint or a Google Slides deck and put all those pictures on a tweet, right. but who wants to look at that, right? So this way, it's me out walking, showing off my neighborhood, and recording a reflection on something I just heard that allows me to connect with the content creator yourself or whoever's podcast it is and the guests that they had on that. So we are building connections, right? And so that's the way it started for me. Well, then that's it kind of in the middle. And then Chris Nessie said, you know, Brian, you got your daily. Chris Nessie is the host of House of EdTech. He's been podcasting now for seven years and has had a huge influence in a number of podcasters yep. he reached out to me back in the in the winter in, in December and he's like you need to start your own podcast and I'm like with what he goes your daily videos take the audio out of those stitch it all together and put it out there I'm like who's gonna listen to this right who like and and he's like people will listen you're gonna find that there's people that can't listen to the daily every day on Twitter but they can listen to a 25 minute podcast of you talking about all these other podcasts, maybe on a Saturday morning or on a Sunday evening or whenever they can, when they're driving down the road. And so I did, I started and you know, George, it was scary that first day. It was January 5th and Chris Nessie and I were supposed to meet. And then he's like, Oh, by the way, I got to be at this podcaster summit. Um, why don't you come with me, Brian? And I'm like, are you kidding? And so it was, it was Tim Cavey's Teachers on Fire, and he had a podcaster summit, the first one for 2021. And Chris is like, Brian, here's the link, jump in. So I didn't even talk to Tim. Tim and I are friends, like him and I know each other, but I'm like, okay, Tim will be cool if I show up, maybe. Like, I didn't know who was going to be in the room. And I stepped into the Zoom room, and I was like, holy cow, look at these rock stars. I'm in this room with these competent podcasters and who am i i'm the noob i'm not even a noob yet i'm like pre-noob didn't even have my anchor account set up a place to put this stuff and chris was like hey this is brian and everybody welcome brian i'm like are you kidding me it was just awesome so mm -hmm. after that session that night chris took the time and we did a live stream you can watch that struggle of actually setting up your anchor account and if you need a tutorial on how to do that that's that live stream he's like brian do you want to do a live stream after this and we'll just record it and then other people can learn and that was the first day on january 5th press send it went and now i am 
thankful that you know I've been doing it. This is my I'm recording for the 29th episode right now, and you can go find that podcast at uh, Fresh Air at Five on Anchor, on um, Spotify, on an Apple Podcast, it'll and be, places like that. Like, it'll be linked below too. So anyone yeah. that is interested in listening, just check out the notes below. Uh, when yeah. you're talking about uh, kind of doing videos and how freaked out you were doing the podcast. Uh, Twitter opened up, um, this is very early on. Well, early, like it seems, I don't know, early on is like what, five years ago, maybe now, I don't know, could be 10, but they had a, a, all of a sudden they didn't have video, right? You couldn't actually upload videos and that was like a new feature, but at the time it was only 30 second videos. And what I did, um, was I'm like, Hey, I'm going to try this out. Mm -hmm. And I tried this, uh, 30, uh, I call it 30 seconds in EDU. Uh, and basically I, or edu in 30 seconds, I think that was the hashtag that I started using. And I would just like, Hey, here's a question about education. Uh, you have to respond back using uh, a video, like, and you only mm -hmm. have 30 seconds. Cause you can't, which was kind of nice. Like I actually like that feature. Uh, you know, it's very TikTok. -y. you know, TikTok's even like going to three minutes. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I don't like when they expand because I think there's something about being concise. That's Absolutely. Really powerful. Uh, yeah. And the reason I bring this up, I remember I was actually in California recording this and I was sweating. I felt disgusting. I had like turned that off, uh, like probably about 30 times before I actually uploaded the video I was comfortable with. Right. Right. And yeah. I think a lot of times, you know, we become so comfortable that we forget that's, that's, you know, we were freaked out too. And kind of like, you know, people are taking different steps. Um, through that process. But I think, you know, when the, the term, like you refer to like rock stars and things like that, I think it's really cool to talk to different educators that, you know, maybe have big followings, things like that. It's not to me, it, like, it's just not something that uh, I, I appreciate talking to anybody that's involved in education. I think some of the <laughs> best teachers don't aren't on Twitter, right? Some of the, you know, and I'm and, yeah. uh, like, I used to think, that authors were like such a big deal until I became an author, you know, and I was like, no, well, obviously that's not true. Right. It, it is cool yeah. because, and someone would come up to me and say like, Oh my God, I love your book. And I'll tell you, I was way more excited that they said they love my book more than they were probably <laughs> excited to me. I'm like, someone read my book. Like this is like, that's not my mom. And it's just kind of a, it's kind <laughs> of a cool thing. And I think the reason I'm saying this is because I think there's this artificial, um, barrier that people create in their minds that they can actually just reach out to these people. Right. And I think sometimes, yeah. you know, like I don't respond to everybody on Twitter because I'm not always on Twitter and it's not, um, and, and you know, um, people that are respectful to me and, you know, I'll try my best to connect with them. Uh, but, but I think that, uh, is like, you can reach out to these people, you can have these conversations and, uh, I, the, there, there's some people doing really amazing work that you might not know of. And so I don't limit it to, uh, like following size means nothing. Like it, it really, to be honestly, no, it absolutely means not. nothing in education. And, and I think, uh, just, just connect with these people. Cause I think for me, it's an honor when I have people uh, you know, connect with me in these different spaces, sharing ideas. And some of my favorite blog posts I've ever written are an idea. I saw some, someone share that had 15 followers at the time. And I was like, Oh, that's yeah. such a cool idea and, uh, connecting. So uh, I'm going to ask you a, a personal question. You live in British Columbia. Uh, yes. You live in Abbotsford, Abbotsford, pretty close to the ocean. Uh, we're about 80 kilometers from the ocean here. Lucky. That's uh, very lucky. I'm, I'm in landlocked Alberta. So for for those for those of uh, people listening, uh, what is your favorite thing about living in British Columbia? Because it's it's like literally one of the nicest places in the world. I think one of my yeah. favorite things. Yeah. Okay, my favorite thing, honestly, is that I don't have to shovel much snow every year, like hardly at all. I'm dead serious. I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, and. Yeah. I grew up in a townhouse and my responsibility for shoveling slow snow was the little pathway that went out to our cars. And so I hardly did. I didn't shovel driveways or anything like that. Um, but I love the weather here. Um, what I do miss is in the winter, it is gray. It is like really gray a long time. And so that first year that we moved here in 2000, we drove from Lake Louise where it was sunny and we came over the kicking horse pass down into BC into golden and we drove into the clouds in the fog and I honestly didn't see the sun for two weeks. 
Like it was foggy. It was gray. It was raining. And, you know, it took a couple of years to get through that, but you know, I can do a lot of things in the rain in the winter. You know, you get your Gore-Tex jacket, you get your waterproof shoes and you go outside, you go for a walk. And, you know, this past year I walked every day except for maybe two days because it was, I couldn't walk in the morning because of the weather. It was too snowy or too icy. Right. And so that's, yeah. And uh, what else do I like? Um, The mountains here are different than what we have in Alberta. Like growing up in Calgary, I was a lot closer to the Rockies than you are in, in where you are in Stony Plain, which is like two and a half hours. Uh, Yeah. Something like that. I'm in Edmonton. Yeah. So it's about two and a half, three hours. Yeah. yeah, two and a half, three hours. Whereas in Calgary, we were like an hour outside of, you know, the foothills and, and the front mountains. Um, I miss those mountains because of the ruggedness and steepness and jaggedness of them. But here, you know, I've got hills and mountains around us. And I look at Mount Baker in Washington from my back window every day. And it's absolutely spectacular. Like every morning I walk, I'm looking at Mount Baker, right? And and so there's a whole lot of different activities you can do here that, you know, you can do year, all, all year round. I didn't fish before I moved out here. And now I can fish 12 months a year here. You know, I can go out to the, the river and go salmon fishing in the fall. Then in the winter, I go steelheading and, you know, chasing these elusive fish. And uh, in the spring, we go up to the interior to Kamloops area, you know, where there's all the forest fires now. But uh, we go lake fishing up there, right? And then uh, lots of kinds of things that you can do all year round it's and and there's snowshoeing they're skiing around here you know like back in alberta but you don't have to drive near as far to do them so well you you had me had no shoveling snow i don't touch that stuff there's no that's I right let us know it is the worst i grew up in saskatchewan so it's probably yeah. worse there but hey brian thanks for being on the podcast thanks for uh inspiring uh, probably a lot of people to jump in the same way you know chris uh inspired uh you know and, and supported us uh, as we were doing podcasts and kind of going through your steps. And so uh, it's great to just sit down and chat with you. It's one of my favorite things about the podcast is that we probably never just sat down and had this long of a conversation, even though we've known each other for about 10 years. And so I appreciate right. you tagging me uh, and uh, sharing your learning and kind of, you know, you, I push your learning, you push mine, we push back and just kind of help us all grow. And I think it's all about that community that we're building. And you're just such a great model of that. So Brian, thanks for being on the podcast. Uh, anyone that wants to follow Brian, just check out the links below and you'll see links to his uh, Twitter, uh, his podcast. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for everyone for taking time to listen. Thanks everybody.